All right, welcome everyone to our second part on, on regression analysis with R. And we are continuing from where we ended uh, last time. So we have heard about ANOVA in one way or the other. And so for this particular slide, we just want to mention that we have what we call ANOVA and ANCOVA. And I think in our preceding lectures, we are going to learn what they really would do when it comes to statistical analysis or statistical inference. So we have the ANOVA as an, as an acronym for analysis of variance and ANCOVA also as an acronym for analysis of covariance. So technically, we have what we call dummy variables. And those are variables that assume the values of zero and one. So we normally say they are mutually exclusive classification of variables. And typical examples of dummy variables include gender, so where we have male, female, marital status, where we have single, married, divorced, and widowed. We have region east, west, north, and south. So technically, dummy variables are categorical variables. However, we tend to make these categorical variables assume the values of just zero and one. And when that happens, they are classified as dummy variables. So when you grab gender, for instance, once it's categorical with two categories, male and female, those are just categorical variables. But gender becomes a dummy variable when we assign the value labels zero and one to its categories, right? So technically, Whenever you are running a regression model and your independent variables are exclusively dummy or categorical or qualitative in nature, then you are running what we call ANOVA models. So all your independent variables having categorical variables are called ANOVA models. But if you are running a regression model where it contains a mixture of quantitative, so for instance, you might have uh, years of education in there, you might have wage. So you have some of these quantitative variables in, in as, as independent variables in the model. And you also have as well qualitative variables like gender, uh, marital status, all of these mixture of quantitative and qualitative variables. Then you are running what we call ANCOVA models or analysis of covariance. So later on in some of the lectures ahead, we are going to um, categorically learn how we can conduct ANOVA tests and ANCOVA tests uh, when it comes to generalized linear models and all those sort of things. But let's just have this in mind that if you are running a regression model and your independent variables are all qualitative in nature or categorical, they are called ANOVA models. But if you have a mixture of both quantitative and qualitative variables, then you are running what we call ANCOVA models. So there are some functional forms in econometric analysis that we will be encountering some time to come. And these are the four that have been represented in the slide. So we have the log log model. Now in econometrics, anytime you mention a functional form or you want to take the log of a particular variable, we mean the natural logarithm. And so we know we have two basic logarithms. We have the common logarithm, where it is a logarithm with a base of 10. And we also have the natural logarithm, which is a logarithm with a base of E, all right? So whenever you hear of log um, instances, regression models, 99% of the time, we are referring to the natural logarithm, all right? So we do have log, log model, and we are going to explain some of these uh, very soon. We also have the log linear model, sometimes also referred to as the log lane model. We have linear log model, also referred to as lane log model, and we also have the reciprocal model. So when we have a log log model, it means that your dependent variable is logged and you've also taken the natural logarithm of your independent variable. So your variables in the models are all logged. So in that case, this is how you get to interpret it. It means that you are measuring some kind of an elasticity. So if you look at the coefficient, the relationship that exists between y and x, you notice that we have the natural logarithm applied to these two variables. And so the beta one coefficient, when interpreting it, takes an assumption of elasticity. 
right? Such as we know elasticity in terms of economics. For those who have heard of economics before, we are just looking at just a percentage change in quantity that is demanded of a good due to a certain percentage change in price. So whenever you, you see logarithm applied to both dependent and independent variables, then their coefficient interpretation is going to be in percentage form. So this means we're just going to say that a 1% change in X will lead to beta 1 percentage change in Y, right? So once assuming you estimated that a beta 1 is positive, then you're just going to say that whenever there is a 1% increase in X, there is going to be a beta 1 percentage increase in Y. And it goes for the other direction as well. When there is a 1% decrease in X, it's going to lead to beta 1% decrease in Y. So they all move in the same direction if the coefficient of the independent variable in there is positive, just like we've been interpreting before, all right? So that is how you get to interpret this. So the beta 1 is already in percentage and it applies to how a change in, a percentage change in the dependent, independent variable leads to a percentage change in the dependent variable. We also have the log linear model. In that case, the logarithm is applied to the dependent variable, but our independent variable is already in the linear form. There is no natural logarithm applied to that. So if you want to interpret this, it means that the coefficient of X, which is beta one is in units, whereas the interpretation onto how it affects a change in Y should be in percentage because the Y, uh, we've taken the natural logarithm of Y. So when you are interpreting um, a given change in X, that is going to be just a unit because log is not applied to X, but with the interpretation to how it affects the dependent variable, it must be converted to a percentage to suit that logarithm over there. There is a whole mathematics and algebra behind why we would have to, for instance, interpret log log models in terms of percentages, all right? But we are not going into the depth, so I'm just giving you an exclusive conclusion or summary to how we interpret some of these things, all right? So it means that over here, you're just going to say that a one unit change in X, because we've not taken the natural logarithm of X, so a one unit change in X will lead to beta one is already in units, but the dependent variable is logged. And so we would have to convert the beta one to a percentage to suit the logarithm of the dependent variable. And so for that matter, we multiply the coefficient beta one by 100%. So it's going to be a one unit change in X leads to beta one times 100% change in Y. So that is how we interpret log linear model. With the linear log model also, the dependent variable is in its linear form, but the independent variable, the natural logarithm is applied. And so it means that the coefficient of the independent variable X is already in percentage. But if we are looking at how it affects Y, we would have to convert this one to unit to suit the linear form of a dependent variable. And so if you want to interpret this um, result, it is going to say that a 1% change in X leads to beta one that we divide by 100 to convert it to unit change in Y. A 1% change in X leads to beta one divided by 100 unit change in Y. And then with the reciprocal model, we do have the reciprocal of the independent variable. That is the focus. And so what is going to happen is whenever there is a one unit change, so assuming it is an increase in X by one unit, then there is going to be a beta one unit decrease in Y. Now look at something. With a reciprocal model, the coefficient is beta one. Assuming we calculate and then we get a positive value, right? It would have meant that if we did not have the reciprocal, an increase in X would lead to an increase in Y by that beta one value. But because the X now is in a reciprocal form, an increase in X would rather lead to a decrease in Y. So we will look at this very soon. So let's go right into R and have a feel of that. Now, one thing that I want you to understand when it comes to some of these functional forms is that there are instances where you need to apply them. So we just, we just don't go ahead and assume that we are just going to apply, apply logarithms to a dependent variable or 
any of the independent variables, no? But depending on the situation, they will get to understand how some of these functional forms are applied. And so we'll get to understand them, but we're just going to implement them as they are, as raw as they are, with no econometric intuition or statistical intuition as to why we are doing so. But later on, when we move on to the next lecture, which happens to be on the problems that we encounter in regression analysis, one of the problems will have its remedy to be that you can take the natural logarithm of, of, of the variable. So you must specify a log-log model, all right? So when we get there, then you would have heard already about the functional forms and the reason why we need to apply that to solve that particular problem, okay? so. Um, let's take them literally for now and just implement them with interpretation so we can get to understand what is really going on. So at this point, we just know that we are moving on to what we call the functional forms. So with the functional forms, we do have the log log model. So the log log model is the first one. And so we would have to run regression analysis, right? But I am implementing these codes in the same sort of script that we worked with the last time we met. And so I will just go straight up there and we are going to use the same package that we used before, which is the Woodrid package, where in there we have the wage one data set. So if I run this line of code and then I go ahead and run the data function with the wage one data set in there, then we will have imported our wage one data set, right? where we had variables such as education, wage, experience, tenor, the square values of experience and tenor and all those sort of things, right? So these are the things that we are actually looking at. So once this has been imported, you know, let me just go ahead and also load the tidy verse because it's a very key component when it comes to data analysis, visualization and manipulation. So let me run that line of code as well. And the tidy verse is there where we can access the chain operator and then we can chain functions to data and all of that where and there is the need for us to do so. So once we have that, I can go back down to where we have the functional forms uh, theme and we'll just proceed with the log log model. So first things first, what we want to do is let us create a model and I would like to call it log log model where we would run a linear regression model with wage as our independent variable and then education as our wage as dependent variable and education as independent variable. All right, so here we have this sort of result. So we are just doing what we call the simple regression analysis where we have only one independent variable in there. So if I run this line of code and then I kind of go ahead and summarize the model before I apply the logarithms, it says model not found, oh, sorry. So it's supposed to be log, log model is what I created. And if I run this, I am getting this result. But mind you that we have not applied any logarithm to both sides of the, of, of the dependent and uh, independent variable. So at this point, why don't we just introduce the log to the variables? So here, I'm just going to say the log of wage, and then we also have the log of education. So now the whole thing is maybe, did we know that we had a function called log? Um, why don't we find out? Now, if I just go in there and I'd say, let us look at the documentation on log, then you notice that we have logarithms and exponentials, but the main function is log. And then it is part of the base package, so we do not need to install anything. So at this point, um, the log takes in two set of arguments. We have the value for which you want to take the log, and then the base. Okay, so already the base is EXP of one. Now the EXP, EXP function of one is 2.718282. And for those of you who know what this EXP really means, there is a constant term, a parameter, which is known as the E, just as we have pi. So we've come across this before. If I just type pi and I run, we have 3.1415. And in mathematics, we've been coming across this pi. So in R, it's just simply the pi, all right? But we also have another constant that is also called the e. Now, that e is exponential function, all right? So exp means e 
raised to the power something. But E raised to the power of one means we are just placing the value of one inside the ESP function. And so when you run that, we are getting the 2.718, okay, 282. Now, these constant terms, the pi and the exponential parameter, they are sort of values where their decimal numbers never end. So they, they do not end. They, they have infinity decimal numbers, but we normally approximate them to certain decimal places in order to work with them. And in mathematics, the literal mathematics, we normally see 22 over seven when it comes to geometry. And then when you are dealing with circle theorem and all those sort of things, we see 22 over seven. But in terms of decimals, we normally use the 3.142, rounded to three decimal places. So that is what the ESP actually is all about. So when we have a logarithm to the base of E, that means in our code implementation, we're just going to have the logarithm of a certain number, so let's say 10, with ESP of one. And even the ESP of one means that is the default base that we have here, all right? So I will just go ahead and say like base equals that, okay? So if I run that, we are just having the natural logarithm of 10. This is what it really means. But if I were implementing the logarithm of 10 to the base of 10, now there is a property of logarithm where the logarithm of a number, where the number happens to the same base is always equal to one. So if you have the logarithm of 10 and then you have a base of 10, we get a result as one, all right? So if you have the logarithm of, um, let's say two, and then each base is two, you get the result as one. So the logarithm of a number with that number being the base is always equal to one, all right? Good. So now that we know that whenever you implement just log with a number in there, you simply have the natural logarithm. And then R has included other uh, functions where you can actually specify the, the log with a base of 10 without having to write base as an argument in the log function. So you can just go ahead and say log 10 as a function, you pass in the value of 10. So if I go ahead and say log 10, and then I pass in 10, we get the result as one. Okay, so when you just use the log with nothing in front of that function, you are just applying the natural logarithm. But if you want to um, have the common logarithm, which is the logarithm to the base of 10, you just have to write log 10. If you have just any log with any base, log two. And I don't know whether we have log three, log four, but yes, if you want to have a logarithm of a number to the base of three, you have to specify perhaps the base argument in the log function. So once I have applied the log of wage and the log of education, then we have applied the natural logarithm to both variables in the model. So if I go ahead and run this result, hmm, we are getting infinity. Now, um, and probably that's an error. And the very reason is that, let's see, if I go into the wage one data set and then I view that of wage, then well, there are so many values in there because we have 526 observations. And so what is happening, we might not be able to see this, right? So hmm, if I say wage $1 wage equals zero. So I'm just using the double equal sign to um, ask R whether in the wage column, in the wage one data set, does it have any zero in there? That's what I just want to ask. So when I just run this line of code, I am getting false where there are no zeros and I will get through where there are zeros. And if I look through, I can see that there are no zeros in there, right? So because everything is just false there. All right, so if that is the case, what about wage one dollar education? And then let's find out whether there is a zero in there. So of course I've grabbed one. So we have true, so which means we have a zero value. So could that be the reason, we also have another one here. Could that be the reason why we were getting error when we ran the results? Yes, because if you take the logarithm of zero, we get negative infinity, okay? Negative infinity, the logarithm of zero is negative infinity. So once it is infinity, then R doesn't understand what sort of value that is because even ourselves, we really don't know what infinity means. And so it will kind of give you an error and we are going to encounter that sort of problem. So unless we might have to use 
another sort of data where there are no zero values in there. And then this log log model will work. So which means that if I kind of take away this log, all right, let me go ahead and also find out whether there is any variable in there which has no zero value. So wait one dollar and let's grab years of experience. Hmm, technically there might be instances where somebody might have zero years of experience. So if I run that, do we have any true value in there? Let's see. So false, okay. It's all false, so which means we don't have any zero there. So I think the experience will rather work with, for us. So I will just go ahead and say the log of experience. So I'm running a regression of the logarithm of wage on the logarithm of experience. And then I can now run this line of code and then summarize the model. And when I summarize it, this is the result that we are getting. Now let's see whether our log was really applied. If I had made it wage, on experience where our data equals wage one. And then I place this code inside the summary function and run that. Oh, that is a different result, right? So let me just maximize this window. So we have 5.3 for our intercept, we have 1.3. So which means when our log was transformed onto our variables, it really worked and gave us different sort of results. So our logarithm has been applied, right? So let me clear this. And now let us go ahead and work with our log log model. So let me summarize this. Now, after summarizing, this is how you are going to deal with the whole situation. Like we said, both variables, dependent and independent are in their log form. So if you want to interpret the coefficient, which is the coefficient of experience, then you would have to uh, interpret them in terms of percentage because it follows something that we call elasticity in economics, all right? So you just interpret them in percentage. So this means that a 1% change in experience leads to 0.11686% change in wage, okay? And so maybe the chain doesn't speak so much about the direction, and so once we notice that this is a positive value, then we can say that a 1% increase in years of education will lead to 0.12% increase in the predicted wage or the predicted average hourly earnings that a person is going to get, all right? So rounded to two decimal places, we have 0.12. So like I told you, this value is already in percentage because of the logarithm applied to both dependent and independent variables in the regression model. So that is how you're going to interpret it. But as to when to apply some of these functional forms, like I said, we'll just be encountering them with time. But for now, we take them literally as they are, assuming we are just running um, log log model, right? So if I were also running the log linear model, then I'm going to have the logarithm of wage, and I'm going to regress it on experience. Data is wage one. So now at this point, we are now running a log linear model. So I've just named my object as log lin model, where we are just taking the logarithm of the dependent variable, but our independent variable um, is not logged. And so when we run this model, and then we go ahead and summarize our log lin model. Then we are getting this very result. So because the logarithm is applied to only the dependent variable, it means that yes. the coefficient of experience in um, the coefficient of experience is in unit because we have not applied the logarithm to the to the independent variable. So Perhaps should be. I have it two, three times. Right. So once our independent variable is not logged, then it means that the coefficient of our independent variable is in unit. But because our dependent variable is logged, we would have to transform this coefficient of the independent variable into percentage in order to make it applicable to the log version of the dependent variable. 
So in that case, we've noticed that the value is positive. And so we would say that whenever there is a 1% increase in a years of experience, then it's going to lead to, we need to convert this one to percentage. So 0.004362, we just multiply this one by 100. And that means it is going to lead to a 0.44% increase in wage. All right. So a one unit increase in the years of experience will lead to 0.44% uh, uh, increase in wage. So that is how we interpret log linear models. Then we would implement a linear log model where in that case, our dependent variable is not locked, but our independent variable is locked. So that now if we run this and then we check the summary of lin log model, then we'll notice that once our independent variable is logged, it means its coefficient is already in percentage, but our dependent variable is not logged. So we'd have to convert this value to units. And that means we'll have to divide by 100. So let me first of all divide by the 100. So 7417 divided by 100. And so this means that a 1% because of the log of the independent variable. So a 1% increase. Now the coefficient is positive, right? So a 1% increase in the years of experience will lead to 0 0.007 unit increase in wage. So we we'll convert the coefficient of the experience, the log of experience to units by dividing by 100 because it is already in percentage. So that is also how we work with linear log model. Then the last functional form we are going to look at is the reciprocal model. Now, at this point, we're just going to say wage is regressed on, for instance, experience as we've been working with. So data equals wage one. Before I produce a summary of the reciprocal, Now, how do we then take the reciprocal? Because at the end of the day, we know that it is simply one divided by experience. But is this going to work? We are going to encounter a problem, and I want you to see what problem there is. So if I run this line of code, and I kind of summarize that, you notice that the independent variable does not come into the scene. It only produces that of the intercept. Somehow, it avoids the fact that there is experience uh, there as an independent variable. And the reason is that when you want to apply some of these arithmetic operations, the addition, subtraction, multiplication, modulo, and those arithmetic operations, if you're applying them um, right in regression models, the, the codes that um, it requires to run regression models, um, it is not going to work out, all right? So there are two ways of doing this. The first one is you would have to go into the data frame and create another column where that happens to be the reciprocal of the experience. So you have to create another column. So you know what we have to do? That's the first step. So before I implement this code again, I'm just going to say, let's go into the wage one data set. And then we'll use the mutate function where we are creating a new column. And that new column is going to be, let me just simply call it um, recipe. That's just okay, because I can give it any name I want. Okay, so recipe, which I know is a reciprocal of uh, experience. So once I do this, I'm just going to say one divided by experience. But I would have to save this one into the same data set. So I store that. If I go ahead and run these lines of code, and I go back into the data frame and go to the very last column, you will notice that we have the reciprocal form of the experience created for us. Then we can now go to our code and then we can just go ahead and use that variable that we created and then run our uh, regression model. So we run this and we summarize and then we are able to get this very result, right? We're able to get this very result. Another way you can also do this is whilst you have our reciprocal model, 
Then in order to apply any arithmetic operation, which is the one divided by that to make it work, then you would have to wrap this inside a certain function that is called i, the i function. And if we should try to look at the meaning behind it, it says inhibit interpretation, conversion of objects, right? So the most important thing is conversion of objects. That is, it changes the class of an object to indicate that it should be treated as is. So when we just made it one divided by experience, which of course we are just trying to take the reciprocal of that independent variable, um, R somehow is not taking it as it is, as one of our experience. So it kind of, maybe it's not understanding what the whole thing is. So it just removes it, all right? Now, I would show you very soon why we had only the intercept because it read only weight on one and we'll come back to that one. But if you want R to treat one divided by experience as is, then you would have to wrap that inside of the I function, all right? So in which case, I would just have to go ahead and say I, yeah. Then now I can go ahead and summarize. So summary of reciprocal model. Now let me call this one model one. So we observe the similarities. So this one is model two and this one is model two. So now let me run this one as model one and this one as model two. And let us summarize model one and summarize model two and just look at whether they actually yielded the same result. So right here, you can see we have the one divided by experience inside of the I function, and it gives us an intercept of 6.5 and then the coefficient of the reciprocal form of the variable as negative 3.6. Is that the same thing that we have here? That's the very same thing, okay, with the same standard errors and the T values and all of that. So now it means that if you want to apply any arithmetic operations, such as taking the square of experience and all those sort of things, you can see that in the wage data frame, we have a, a variable that is created already for you as experience squared and then tenor squared. So if you were including the square of experience and the square of, uh, of tenor, then you can refer to these variables there. But if you wanted to use the arithmetic operation to, for instance, say wage on experience to the power two like this, then you would have to wrap this one inside of the I function to treat it as is. That would make it work, okay? So we understand where this I is now coming from. So once this has happened, it is a reciprocal model and you can see that the coefficient of experience is rather negative three, right? So if we were somehow forming the regression model, then it would have been wage equals, so, let me comment this line of code that I'm writing here. So it would have been wage on the intercept, right? And the intercept we found to be 6.5211 minus the coefficient 3.6466. And then I know that this one is one divided by experience. Okay. So we have estimated this very result. And so this is what I want us to do. Now, if I grab this and then I paste it here. So let me just ignore the fact that there is a wage. And then over here, in order to make this work, that is the coefficient multiplying the reciprocal. Of course, there has to be the multiplication sign between them, right? So we have 6.5211 minus 3.6466 times one over the level of experience. Now, if I make the level of experience one and run this, we get 2.8745. What if I make it two? 4.6. If I make it three, 5.3. If I make it four. So what is happening? As the values of experience increase by one unit, what happens to wage? It also increases. All right, this is because this is a reciprocal model and do not be confused about the sign of the coefficient right here. If we were taking the literal experience and it was negative, then we'd say that whenever experience increases by one unit, there's going to be a decrease in wage by that value. But because the, the experience is not the literal variable, but rather an inverse, 
when there is an increase in experience, now the negative here is going to tend to positive, right? So we just observe it right here. So as the years of experience increases by one unit, or let's say if experience increases by one year, then the predicted wage that a person is going to receive in the state is also going to increase by the coefficient, which is 3.46466. All right. So whenever you are taking the, um, the reciprocal of the independent variable, if the sign is positive, an increase leads to a decrease. If a sign is negative, an increase leads to an increase. So just be um, cautious about how you tend to interpret some of these uh, results, right? So if you are not sure of how to interpret them, of course, we can experiment with the equation right here and then be increasing the values to see whether uh, your dependent variable is increasing or decreasing before you can attempt to make an interpretation so that you don't, make it, you don't get it actually wrong, right? So um, that is how we implement some of these things. So these are the functional forms that we have taken into consideration. And so later on, we'll come across when we need to apply some of these. And if you remember in our earlier parts of statistical inference lectures, okay, there was a point where we said that if our data is not following the normal distribution, sometimes we'd have to transform them. And one of them is the logarithm, logarithmic transformation, right? And then the um, inverse transformation, okay, the square root transformation. We have all of these things there. So eventually with time, we'll get to understand how some of these transformations are done. But when it comes to regression models, these are where the functional forms come in. So log log model, log lin model, lin log model, reciprocal model. Eventually, we'll get to know what they really are. So the most important thing is to understand the interpretation. Then later, when it comes for you to apply, you will be able to do so. So we proceed from there. Now there is what we call the dummy variables. We've just mentioned it just a few uh, minutes ago. And so it says that sometimes you would want to capture the effect of categorical variables on a dependent variable. So examples are like gender. So you want to look at how uh, gender affects maybe wage or what is going to be the differences in wage for males and females in the United States, maybe marital status. Maybe are single people receiving more wages than those who are married or those who are divorced or those who are separated, depending on which categories that you actually want to work with. Because with marital status, we have some uh, research studies actually having these four categories, such as they have single, they have married, they have divorced, and they have separated. And some too just go ahead and say, well, single or married. All right. So it depends on how many categories that you want to define, but let's understand what dummy variables really are in terms of categorical variables. So we also have education level. Maybe you have no education. It's one category. You have um, a primary education. You have a junior uh, high school education. You have a senior high school education. You have a tertiary uh, qualification and all those sort of things. We have religion. You may be a, a Christian or you may belong to Islamic religion or you may be uh, um, um, what do you call it, a, a Hindu, you may be a Buddhist, you, you may belong to certain religions that are captured in the data frame. So technically, variables have M categories. So gender, for instance, the M represents the number of categories of the variable. So if we take gender, then it means M equals two, because gender has two categories. Now, if we take marital status and we are considering the four categories where we have single, married, divorced, and separated, then M equals four. So marital status would have four categories. So variables with M categories have M minus one dummy variables. So it means if gender has two categories, then how many dummy variables should gender have? One, because two minus one, one dummy. So in a regression model, if you are capturing gender as an independent variable, it means that you don't have to place the two categories in the same model. You must have one dummy. And we are going to look at how we handle those dummy variables in regression models very soon. So if you are looking at marital status with four categories, then there must be three dummies in a regression model. That is what we are just trying to talk about. So for example, gender has two categories, male and female, so it must have two minus one dummy variables. Let's say marital status also has four um, categories, single, married, separated, and widowed, so it must have how many dummies? Three dummies. 
Now, dummy variables take only two values, or we just say codes, or sometimes value labels, all right? Zero and one, zero and one. So if gender is coded as male equals zero, female equals one, then male, which is equal to zero, is referred to as the reference or the base category. So take notice of that. So if we have gender, we are going to include in a regression model, and it has two categories, male and female. We said the dummy variables must, must take only two values, zero and one. So if we allow male to be equal to zero and female equals one, then the one that is made equal to zero is simply referred to as the reference or the base category. The reference or the base category. Technically, any of the categories where you assign the value of zero means it should be absent from the model, meaning it has it is taken out there and placed somewhere as a reference point. But the one that takes the value of one means it is present in the model. So zero means absence of the attribute or the variable. One means presence of the attribute. But let's understand that when it's equal to zero, it is called a reference or the base category. It will help us in our interpretation very soon. Marital status could also be coded as single equals zero, then the rest of them all equals one. So single is zero, then married is one, widowed is one, separated is one, divorced is one, and all those sort of things. So um, at the end of the day, uh, what do we have here? Single has been assigned the value of zero. So single is referred to as the reference or the base category. All right, so let's understand that. Reference or the base category. All right. Now, the reference or base category, since coded as zero, means it is absent from the model. So we take it off from the model. The rest of the categories coded as one indicate that they are present in the model. So let's say you wanted to estimate the effect of years of education on average hourly earnings, but at the same time, you would want to find out gender, how gender affects the average hourly earnings as well. So in that case, your typical econometric model is going to be the wage happens to be the dependent variable and you are regressing it on the education and that of gender. Now, the education we said is the years of education. So it's quantitative in nature. Gender is categorical, so it's qualitative in nature. Do you remember the type of models that we talked about? Yes, when there is a mixture of quantitative and qualitative variables, we call this an COVA model. So if you want to run any sort of test to understand how these interact with each other, then ANCOVA analysis would really help you. All right, we'll come to them later. So we are regressing wage on education and gender. Now, mind you that in our Woodrick package where we have the wage one data set, we do have wage, we have education. Have we seen gender? We'll go and find out. So here, we are just going to let male equals zero and then female equals one. Then the model correctly becomes wage equals our beta zero, the intercept plus the slope coefficient with education there and then plus the slope coefficient for female, because female equals one, it is present. But for the male equals zero, it is absent. So it means that you don't have to, um, whilst you have stated your general regression model as education and gender, then you would have to specifically notice how you code them. And so once male is zero, that means you take it away from the model, it becomes a reference point. Then the female equals one means it should be there, so we include only that of the female um, in the regression. That is what really happens behind the scenes when we run some of these regression uh, models, right? So let's say you wanted to estimate the effect of years of education on average hourly earnings, but at the same time, we want to find out how marital status affect the average hourly earnings as well. So our regression model is going to be weight equals beta not plus beta one education plus beta two marital status. And we are using M-A-R-S-T-A-T -T, um, as the variable notation for marital status. So in that case, if marital status 
has these four categories, single, married, divorced, and widowed. And we let single to be equal to zero, then the rest of them can be coded as one. So when that happens, our regression model would be single zero, married one, divorced one, widowed one. So it correctly becomes education plus the married comes in, divorce comes in, widowed comes in. But what is left out? The single, because it has been given the value of zero. So the single becomes that reference point or the base category. So we just dump it somewhere and we'll see how we, we handle the whole thing. So now, instead of, instead of um, um, three coefficients, beta zero, beta one, beta two, you are now going to have how many coefficients? Oops, I think I made a mistake with the numbering of the coefficient. So it should be beta zero. Um, I think nothing should stop me from just making that change. So beta zero, beta three, and then uh, beta four, All right? So that is how your regression model now becomes. So when that happens, you will be able to capture the effect of education on wage, and those who are married on wage, those who are divorced on wage, those who are widowed on wage with these three dummies in there serving as the kind of interpretation as against the reference category or the base category there. So now let's go ahead and practice this. So we just go into R and then let me name this one as dummy variables. So there are a few data management that we are going to do so far. And so when we go into the wage one data set, now I should be, I should declare that there is this variable called female. So you've noticed that they've already coded one, one, zero, zero. So we are going to work with it, all right? So the one means, of course, that is a female, but the zero means that is the male. So. Um, if we are run the regression model, we're just going to say um, our model is LM wage on education class female. Then our data simply equals wage one, like that. Then we'll go ahead and summarize our model. So let's run this and see what result that we're going to get. So if I run this line of code, and then we summarize, then the intercept is 0 0.622. And we said the intercept usually is, is not so intuitive. So let's look at the coefficient of education. And it is positive right there. So we can go ahead and interpret and we would say that look at the p-value. It means it is significant at 1% level. So I can say that there is a significant positive. Now look at the words I'm just forming up with the interpretation. So I will come to the increase in education leads to increase in, I'll come back to that one. So I'm just going to establish a point. I'm just going to say, there is a significant positive relationship between wage and the years of education, such that a one unit increase in the years of education will lead to an increase in wage by $0.51. So 51 cents, all right? So that is how we are just going to look at it. Or sometimes you would want to say, well, a one unit increase in education will lead to an increase in the predicted wage by 0 0.51. And this relationship between wage and education is found to be statistically significant at 1% level, all right? So we are building up how some of these interpretations are done. But let's look at the coefficient of uh, female captured in the model. It is negative and you can see it is also very significant. So there is a significant negative relationship between what the female ends, all right, as against that of the male. So the male, which has been coded as zero becomes the reference point. So you are just going to say that um, a person that is a female, all right, a person that is a female in the United States has um, the predicted wage is set to decrease by 2.274 females in the United States. 
So the predicted average hourly earnings, the predicted wage for a female, because it is a female that is present here. That is how we interpret it. So we are not just going to say that whenever there is a one unit increase in female. No, we, we don't do that, right? So we're just going to say uh, females in the United States, um, the predicted wage for females in the United States would decrease by 2.27 as against that of the males. So once the coefficient here is negative, once the predicted wage is decreasing by this value, it means for males, it is rather increasing. So the males will take the opposite of this coefficient. But because the female is the one that is made to be present in the model, you are interpreting the female. So this is how you reference the male. So you are just, you are just going to say that um, females on average, it's said to have a decrease in their predicted wage by 2.27 as compared to that of males. You see how we capture the males in, in the interpretation. That is how it works. So um, for every female in the United States, the predicted wage is going to decrease by 2.27 as compared to that of the males. Uh -huh. That is how we, we just do it. Or sometimes someone would say, um, the predicted wage for females in the United States would decrease by 2.27 as against that of the males, right? So whenever you are doing interpretation of dummy variable, you do that in reference to the, the one which you have made as the reference category or the base category. Um, in the wage one data set, the whole thing is we do not have, do we have married, single, married, single? Let's see. Yeah, we do have married, but I think it's only not married against married. So. I would say that one means the person is married and zero means the person is single. So we only have two categories. So let's do some data manipulation where we will create our own fictitious data added to this data frame, where we have four categories, single, married, divorced, and widowed. We'll add them and we'll see how we capture them in regression models, okay? So this data that came from the wooded package has already been cleaned. So we just use them as it is. That is why we noticed that we had the category for female, but not gender in general, right? So um, let's, let's box on, let's manipulate our data to make it look like we have our data in its raw form. Now we now need to clean it and use that for our regression uh, models. Let's just observe that for our wage one data set, they had a female um, category where when we included into our regression model, we had the coefficient to be negative two, so understood. All right. Now this is what I want us to do. You know, whenever you open a data frame in the script window, there are some arrows um, sitting at the very corners of each variable. And those arrows are, when you click on them, it's like you are sorting the values from ascending to descending, descending to ascending and all those sort of things. So for instance, um, if you look at the female, we have one, one, zero, zero, zero. But if I click on any of these arrows there, we can see that the zeros come first, then followed by the one. So it has sorted them from um, um, uh, in ascending order, all right? So smallest to largest. So I would kind of close this window and open it again. And then we have what we had originally. So those are some of the things that I want to look, tell you about when it comes to these data frames here. So now I am going to create another category, okay, another column called gender, where it is going to depend on this very column female. And in that gender there, where it is one, we want the label female to be applied. And where it is zero, we want the label male to be applied. So let's create a new column. So let me come down here. So um, this one, let me just write it as some data manipulation. Some data manipulation. So we are just going to say, we take the wage one data set, and then we go in there and mutate. That means we're going to create a new column. And that new column is going to be called gender categorically. And then we would use the if else function, which takes in three sets of arguments. The first one is the test, which happens to be the condition that we are just going to run. And then the yes means if this test is true, then that should be the code that should be executed. But if this test is false, 
then that should be the third argument that should be executed. So what is going to be the condition? We're just going to say, if else, the female column, right? So we are just grabbing this female column. If the female column equals one, then give it a label of male, sorry, female, and then otherwise just make it male. That is what the if else function does. So if the female is indeed equal to one and it's true, just give it female and then any other thing else, meaning zero or whatever other label is there, just assign the value of male. So we know that we have only zeros and ones. So where this one is going to be female. And so where this test becomes false, that is zero, then it becomes male. So we create that new column called gender and let's run this line of code and see what result we are going to get. So after running this one, let's go back here and you would notice that our gender column has been added up, but in order to be sure that what we did really worked, I'm just going to select the female and that of the gender and I would grab the first 10 observations, right? So I'll select female gender and then the first 10 observations. So when I run that, you notice that where it is one, we have given the label as female, where it is zero, we have the label as male. So that means it worked really well. All right. So once that is done, now we will just kind of assume that, for instance, uh, our female category was not there, but rather gender was given. All right. Gender was given. So once gender is given, then we will now want to include this gender in our regression model. So this is how we are going to do it. Now, the first thing that you need to do or should I even take away the female from there? Because this is our data frame that is built into the Woodridge. Any changes that we are making here doesn't affect the original data frame there. So I can just kind of remove the female because I'm going to create two columns containing male and female. All right, so let me just go here and say, let's grab the wage one data set. And then I'll take the wage one and then I would select excluding a female column and then save it into the same data frame. So if I run that now and I go back to the wage one data set, you'll notice female is nowhere to be found again. So we only have the gender category there, All right? Now, in R, in R, R treats categorical variables our three categorical variables as factor data types, right? Factor data types. So what would be the data type for gender as we have created right now? So what we are going to do is there are, you know, we have worked with the tidy R, we've worked with the deep ply R, we have lessons on that. So I can go ahead and say wage one dollar and I would grab the gender and all I have to do is to wrap this data inside of the class function to give me the class of data or the data type that this variable belongs to. So if I run that, you notice that it is a character data type. And once it is a character data type, if I go ahead and say that, okay, why don't we just take a look at only the first few observations of that? So I would just say one to five, Oops, so one to five. Oops, incorrect number of dimensions. Hmm. All right, all right, all right. Sorry, because when I grab the gender variable from the data frame, it's it's a it's a numeric vector. It's it's a vector and no longer a data frame. So it doesn't have two dimensions. So I just say one to five. All right. So you can see that we have the female, female, male all wrapped in double quotes. So that is a character data type. But like I said, R treats categorical variables as factor data type. So we need to convert the character data type to a factor data type. And this is how we're going to do it. So we grab the wage one data set again, and then we will chain the mutate function as well. So mutate modifies existing columns or create new columns. And I'm going to take the gender variable and I'm going to make it as factor. So as dot factor, and I pass into it the gender variable again. So take the gender variable, make it as a factor data type, and then save it into the same gender variable in the data. And from that data, which one data set, save the whole thing into the same um, sort of data. So if I run this now, and I check the class of gender, we have a factor, All right? We have a factor. 
So now that it is a factor data type, there is also a function that is called levels. Now the levels will look at the levels of factors. It provides access to the levels of attributes of a variable, all right? So all you have to do is to pass into it your variable in there. So if I go ahead and say wage one dollar gender and run that, it means that we have female and then we have male. So the order of the levels revealed by the levels function will tell you that if you use gender in the regression model, it is going to assign the value of zero to the first, um, the first category of the order. All right, of the levels. So female would be assigned the value of zero, and then the males would rather be assigned the value of one. All right. So it means I can go ahead and say LM. So let's summarize. I believe you remember what we had for the coefficient of um, female when we ran our model. It was negative 2.27. But if I go ahead and say the summary of in there, we say LM of wage on education plus the gender, and then our data is wage one, like that. And then we summarize that regression model that we have built right now. You would notice that we do have, let me grab this one up. We do have the same coefficient for education, right? It is the intercept that changes, but intercept is not so intuitive. So let's just um, ignore that for now. But look at the coefficient of female. It was negative 2.27. And look at the coefficient of male. You can see it has gender, which is the name of the column, and then male, so 2.27, which is the very opposite of that. So it means if you were interpreting this coefficient, you're going to say that for every male in the United States, there's going to be an increase in the predicted wage by 2.27 which is just the very opposite of that of the female. So for a female, there is a decrease in the predicted wage by 2.27. But for males, there is an increase, all right? So when we check the levels of the factor data type, of the categorical uh, data type, the female came first. So zero was assigned to the female, and then one was assigned to the male. So female served as a reference category, and the male was included in the model. So even Al knows what it is doing, right? So Al noticed that, it is not that we cannot include both females and males in, in regression models. So it does it automatically for you without having to think about whatever consequence. And the very primary reason why one of the categories must be taken away is because if you include both categories in there, then you have what we call multicollinearity, perfect multicollinearity, which is a very huge problem in, in regression analysis, right? So that is what really happens. That is why all the time, if you have a categorical variable, one of them must serve as a reference category, the rest can come in. Okay, so if you have marital status, four categories, one should go, the three must come. That's how the whole thing is going to be. So that is why it includes that male here. But let's do further data manipulation. So you know something, let me just go ahead and grab this same code and paste it here. And let's save this one as model one. And then the summary of model one, like that. So now let's um, do some further data manipulation. Anytime you are working with regression models and you have categorical variable in there, you must now take each category of the, of the variable and then create as many columns there are for the categories. So if you have gender, which has two categories, then you are going to create two more columns. One male, the other female. If you have marital status and there are four categories, then you are going to create four more columns, each column having a single category. So single in this column, married in this column, uh, widowed in this column and divorced in this column, all right? So for gender, I'm going to create two more columns, which is male and female. And so how do we do this? I'm just going to say, let's grab the wage one data set. And then we are going to use the mutate function again. In the mutate function, I'm going to create a first column called male and a second one called female. So let me just say comma and a second one called female. 
And in the male, I'm going to say if else, the gender equals male, then make it one, otherwise zero. And then for the female, if else function, gender equals female, make it one and then zero. So this means that for the male column, wherever there is a male, it is going to be assigned a value of one. Zero means the other way around the female. And for a female too, we are going to have one and then the others would just be male. So if I run this line of code and then I take the weight one data set and I select gender, male and female because I've created two more columns. Let's look at that in the data frame. If I go there to the far right, I see male, I see female. So I'm grabbing the gender, male, female for you to see what has happened. And let's grab the first 10 observations. Clear the console and run. So you notice that for the male column, where there was a female is zero, but where there was a male is just one, right? Good. For the female column, where there is a female, it's one. Where there is a male, uh, sorry, female is also one, but the male will all be zero, all right? So as we are seeing it there. So when running regression models, you have to grab one of these. You don't have to include all two categories in their separate columns. You don't have to include them. So this is what happens behind the scene. When you just provide the gender column to the linear model function in R, R automatically assigns a value of zero to one of them and then includes the remaining one as part of the regression and gives you the result, all right? So it does all of these things behind the scenes and then grabs one of them. But we have made it explicit. So we've created two additional columns, each having its own category. And we are just going to say model three, LM function, weight on education plus male. And then our data equals wage one. Now, when we finish, we are going to create a fourth model, which is LM on wage on education plus female, and then our data equals wage one. And then when we finish with that, we will now create model five, and then we'll say LM of wage on education plus male plus female, data equals wage one. And let's see what problem you're going to encounter. So when we are done, of course, we'll go ahead and summarize these models. So let me copy this and paste that here and paste that there. So this would be model four and this one would be model five. So let's now brace ourselves for what we're going to get. So let's start with where we have included only males in there. So we run this and we run the summary of that. And what do we see? The same sort of result that we had when we included only the gender uh, variable in there. So we have 2.27, we have 0 0.50 and our intercept as well, right? So positive. So males are going to have predicted increase in weight by 2.27 as, as compared to that of the females. But if I include that of the females instead of the male, oops, oh, sorry. It's model four here. Then the predicted weight for females is also going to decrease by 2.27. So which means if only one of the categories which is going to serve as the dummy variable to include in a regression model happens to be in there, you are going to interpret this as against or as compared to the reference category. So here, the male will become the reference category and it can be made explicit if we run the code where we include only that of the male. So we notice that once it is negative 2.27 for females, of course, for the males, it's positive 2.27. So we're just going to say that uh, for every female in the United States, there's going to be a, a decrease in the predicted wage by $2.27 as compared to that of the males. But for the males, there's going to be an increase. All right. Good. So once we have done that and we have included only the male, we've had a result. We've included the female, we've had a result. Now let's include both male and female and see what result we are going to get. So let me clear the console and let's brace ourselves for our results. Hmm. 
So by doing this, we have the estimate, wonderful. We have the coefficient of education, wonderful. But look at what happens. The male is 2.27, but the female is all Ns, all right? So our notices, there is this perfect multicollinearity there when we include the male and that of the female. So it doesn't even go on to include the results for the females for you and only includes that of the male. And we are going to look at the problem of multicollinearity in our next lecture so you will understand it better, what multicollinearity is and how it affects our models. So you notice that even in as much as we really wanted out to grab the male and the female as two separate independent variables in there, still R is able to go behind the scenes and notices that there is still a problem with you trying to do that. And that is because it will have the problem of perfect multicollinearity. So R gives you any. So R says, well, if you want to force my hand, I'm just going to give you no result for female, but I'll give you that for the male, benefit of the doubt. That's what R is just trying to say. Okay, so you can go ahead and say that, okay, for males, there's going to be an increase in the predicted wage by 2.27 as compared to that of the females. Now, in the entire data frame, we do have how many observations? 526 observations. So it means that if I'm going to create different versions of single married widow, so far, let's spell out the category. So we are going to create a marital status, which is going to be M-A-R-S-T-A-T. I'm going to use that one as a variable. It is going to be single. We are going to have married. We are going to have widowed. And then we're going to have uh, divorced. All right. So we are going to have four categories. So this is what I want us to do. Hmm. I would like us to. OK, how do we do this? Let's say we have M-A-R-S-T-A-T. -A OK, before I assign it, I'm going to say, let us replicate. So we have a function, a function called REP, which is just replicate elements of vectors or list. So right here. And it takes in how many arguments? Two arguments, technically, that's what we are going to use. X and then the times. So I'm just going to say replicate for me, single, how many times? Five times. So if I do that and run, I get single, single, single five times. Okay. So what if I say comma and I replicate again, married, and I say how many times? 10. Then I highlight only this part and run, we get 10 married people. Now, if I put the two codes in a vector form, so I wrap the whole thing in the C function, and then I run, I get five singles, 10 married people, making how many? 15. Okay, so we are keeping track of that. So you know what I want us to do? Now, I can remove the times. So just a single five, married 10. And we run that, and we get the same thing. Okay. Then we are going to repeat again or replicate what is the next category? So single, married, widowed. How many times? Let's say 10 times. And then we'll replicate again, um, divorced. And that also, let's say 10 times. Let me drag this window to the right. So we are repeating this one five times, 10 times, 10 times, and 10 times. So all of them would be 35. So 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, and 35. Okay. But we have 526 observations. So in order to give a fair representation for each of these categories, I would want to make this thing random, right? So why don't I make this one 100? Okay. Uh, there are four categories. So if I make each one of them 100, uh, that would be 400 observations, even not up to the 526. So let's make this one 500. And this one 500. This one two 500. And this one 500. So that we have 2,000 
Okay, so we have 500 singles, 500 married, 500 widowed, 500 divorced. So in all, we have 2,000. And I don't want to print everything. So if I only check the length using the length function, I change that function to the vector that we have created. We have 2,000. So we have 2,000 sample size. Now, once we have this, let me break this one down so that we can fit in a single view. So this is our whole vector. All right. Then if, for instance, I have a vector of 2, 6, 8, 9, 1, 3, what if I try to sample? Let me chain it using the chain operator. So I'll say I will sample 3. So let me highlight this line of code. So we have six items and I'm sampling three out of these six items. So if I run this, I get random three samples from it. Again, another set of sample, another set of sample, another set of sample. Hmm. Okay. There is an argument which is called replace equals true. So when I sample, replace. So I run, I run. I ran so that I can get repeated numbers like 119, but you know, for the first part, it was 362 unique values. It doesn't repeat itself. But once I can replace, you can get two numbers at a time. So replace equals true or replace equals false. It is false by default. So whichever one that you prefer. So anytime I run this line of code, I am sampling three all the time. I keep on running. Okay. So if we understand this intuition, then I believe I can chain the sample and I'm going to sample 526 observations. And should I replace it? Yeah, let's replace it. So we are doing sampling with replacement. So we are sampling from this 2000 sample size of single, married, widowed, and divorced. And you know something? Hmm. We said repeat or replicate single 500 times, married 500 times, widowed 500 times. Now it's all part of the lesson we are learning anyway. It's all part of the lesson. But in the replicate function, there is another argument called each, because if we go down here, we do see each, all right? A non-negative integer. So you can give it a value of one, two, three, four, five, six, and those things. It is repeated each time. So the number of times this one is repeated each time. So I could have just simply say, re replicate, the vector of single, married, widowed, divorced, each 500 times. And then let's check the length that we're going to get. So if I run that, 2000. So it means that this same code could have been shortened to this form. If we consider it short, yes, then you could have used this one. So you create a vector with all these um, categories, and then you say each 500 times. So it's going to repeat single 500, married 500, widowed 500, and then divorce 500. So you could have done that. OK, so whichever one that you prefer, let me just go ahead and comment this one out. So let's say we are still sticking to this one. So we are going to sample 526 observations. And then each time we do a replacement whenever we are taking. So when we grab the first one, there is a replacement. We grab a second replacement like that for 526 times. So that's going to be the vector. OK. Now, I am going to grab the weight one data set. And then I'm going to chain a certain function, which is called bind call, bind calls, all right? It is in deep layout, buying calls. So let me break this one down and then in here, break this one down too as well. And I'm going to grab this one and I'm just going to say M-A-R-S-T-A-T -T simply equals this entire code. So what is happening is I am taking the wage one data set and then I am creating a column called Marta status. And there is single 500 times, married 500 times, widowed 500 times, divorced 500 times. And I'm sampling 526 observations from this 2000 sample size. 
And each time I grab um, one item from the 2000, I'm going to replace it. So I'll do that for 526 times so that we can have a fair uh, representation because I don't want the idea that there should be um, the same sort of numbering, okay? The same sort of sample size for each category so we can have diverse uh, categories. So the bind calls will just create another column called marital status and bind it to the wage one data set. So now if I highlight this entire lines of code and run, and we go into the wage one data set and look at the last column, we have marital status with single, divorced, widowed, which have been sampled, random sampling. Okay, so that has been done. So I use this one to only really explain our point so I can just take it away. So we have bound the marital status as another column to our wage one data set. And we've seen it right there that it is now the last column there. So if I go ahead and check the class of, if I go into the wage one and I take out the marital status and I check the class of the data, it is a character data type. So I want to convert this one to factor. So yes, we take the wage one and then we say wage one. And then I would say um, mutate the marital status column and make it as factor marital status like that. And I will make it a factor. And so when I do that and check the class again, it is now a factor data type. So if I were running the regression model, I'm just going to say model six, is going to be LM of wage on education plus M-A-R-S-T-A-T -T, data equals wage one. So we are including the marital status column there. But before we do this, let me go ahead and check the levels. So wage one dollar marital status. And when we check the levels, which one comes first? Alphabetical order, divorced, married, single, widow. So R automatically, when we run this regression model, R would automatically assign the value of zero to divorced and the value of one to married, single, and that of widow. So when we run this model and then we check the summary of model six, let's see what we're going to get. So if I run this and run that, you would notice that in the result, do we have divorced, which happens to be the first of the levels? No. So we have married, we have single, we have widowed. So it takes the name of the column and assigns the category to that. So uh, marital status married, marital status single and widow because divorced happens to be the base or reference category. So in that case, if I were interpreting this kind of result, I'm just going to say that for every, um, um, whenever there is a one year increase in the years of education, there's going to be an increase in the predicted wage by 0.538. Now, for every person that is married, so married people in the United States, there's going to be a decrease in the predicted wage by 0 0.269 as compared to those who are divorced, all right? So for married people would receive a decrease in predicted wage by 0 0.269 as compared to that of the, those who are divorced. So those who are divorced are going to get an increase in predicted wage by the same value if we are comparing married without of divorced. Then you would have to also grab the single separately. So you're just going to say that um, single persons in the United States would receive on average a decrease in their predicted wage by 0 0.322 as compared to those who are also divorced. So it means that divorced people, when we compare divorce to the single, um, we notice that the divorced people would be earning more than those who are single. And then when we also take those who are widowed, on average, their predicted wage is also going to decrease by 0.405 as compared to those who are divorced. So each of the interpretation you give to each of these categories, each of these dummies, yeah, let me use that term now, each of these dummies in the regression model is going to be as compared to the one that has been used as the reference category, all right? So we are not doing any factor re-leveling. We can re-level these factors so that the single comes first and that will be assigned the value of zero, the rest becomes that one and yeah, but we are not coming to the factor rate leveling. So let's say that we accept what R has actually done here. So divorced, married, single, widow. So R does all these things behind the scenes. But if you wanted to manually, manually include your own set 
uh, sort of um, variables like we did over here in the slides. Okay, so you want to, okay, you want to include married, you want to include divorced, you want to include widowed as um, each separate variable from the categories. Um, then you would have to create your own uh, sort of columns, your own columns for the four categories, all right? And of course, we would have to grab the wage one data set and then we would say wage one, and then we will mutate. And then we'll say, let's grab that of the single. And then we are going to use the if else, right? So if else our marital status equals single, make it one, the rest zero. That's all we need. Now I want to copy this and paste each one of them. So let me copy this, paste, paste and paste. And then I am going to now change this one to married. So I'll do that for all of them. So I'll say married and then this one and that I'll do widowed. And then this one and that as well, I will do divorced like that. And so I can now go ahead and run this sort of code. So where marital status is married, zero, the red, uh, sorry, one, the rest is zero. Where marital status is widowed, one, the rest zero, and like that. So we are manually creating our columns for which we want to include each column in our regression model. So if I run this line of code and we go back to our data frame, then we are just going to have, we are going to have single, widowed, divorced. Where is married? Oh, sorry. There was already a married in there, but it will replace it. Yeah, I think so. There was already a married in there. Yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, so it will kind of um, replace that old version of married, which was used earlier by the new one that we've created. So no, no, that is not a problem. So let's say we have the married, we have the single, we have widowed, and we have the divorced. Okay, so we have it all there. So now, when we looked at how R actually gave us the results from the model, then we're just going to say model seven and then LM of wage on. So let's do that for education. And now we are going to include married, single, widowed. So we would have married plus single plus widowed. And then our data is the wage one data set. Then we can go ahead and run a summary of model seven. All right. So once we have this, it means we are including married, single, widow separately. Okay, but like I said, you don't need to do that. You just pass into the thing, your variable and I would handle the rest. Okay, so, but we are just doing it uh, behind this, like, just like R was doing behind the scenes, we are doing that. We are just trying to replicate that same sort of thing that R did instead of putting the same, the, the entire variable there. So we will just do this and then run the result and see whether we're going to get the same sort of uh, results that we have. So if I run this and I run that, now let's compare. Okay, you are not letting us view everything. So the summary of model, okay, anyway, let's say model six, and then model seven, not the summary. And are they the same? Yes. You notice that when we use only the marital status there and the divorce was made the reference category and married single widowed were brought in there as part of our results, but we did it manually, married single widowed. What did we have? The same result for married, the same result for single, and the same result for widowed. The same sort of results, right? So, um, would you rather want to create your own new set of columns in R and include them in your regression model, or you just simply pass your categorical variable there and R will do the rest for you? So you just decide upon that. So um, we have just gone ahead and do the whole sort of things. Now, one thing also is that I think a typical question so far that came was, Maybe you were just trying to look at, uh, for instance, if you look at a categorical variable, the categorical variable was marital status, okay? And this marital status 
had four categories. Now, maybe you are influenced or you are thinking that, okay, well, why don't I just run the regression of maybe just on education and those who are married? Hmm. Now, when you do that, it means that you are just looking at the fact that when you include this married name, the married column that you have created would only have two categories because zero and one. Where the zero means not married and the one means married. Okay, when you include this one, wherever the value is one for that column, it means married. The remaining one is just not married. The rest of them is not going to be single or divorced or widowed, no. It's not going to be like that. So you have reduced the marital status to only two categories. That is married and not married. And the not married, you can interpret as single. What about the divorced and that of the widow? All right. So that is why if by virtue of the fact that a categorical variable comes with four categories, automatically, if you run a regression model of, on that particular categorical variable, you must always include the number of categories minus one dummy variables in there, all right? So at the end of the day, marital status has four categories. You must have three dummies. Must, it's a must, it's not a should. So it's not a suggestion, it's, it's compulsory. So that you would be able to effectively capture marital status and all its categories and how it influences your dependent variable. So when you create your four new set of columns, you cannot just say you want to use only one. If you use only one, that is, for instance, if I use the widowed, then it means that you are just saying that the widow is just only two categories. So zero means not a widow and one means a widow. And then not a widow, you cannot say it represents divorced and single and married. No, it is only not a widow and a widow. So that is why always or the case, you must bring three dummies in regression models if there are four categories. So thank you all uh, very much for attending this meeting. And then we will proceed with the problems of regression analysis um, in our next lecture. And so thank you very much and we'll see you in the next lecture.